And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the bourbon flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly! This segment is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the Next Generation Firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research, visit sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud to engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And by Black Squirrel. Pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now, fire up a pack of capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. I'm your host, a man whose chest hair really isn't on his chest, in a hair length rivaling that of Jack Daniel's beard. I'm Paul Asadorian. Welcome to Security Weekly, episode 402. That's right, 402. And this is first law requiring high school students. January 15th. Background noise there. Sounded like Space Rogue, which doesn't surprise me. In any case, it's January 15th on Thursday in 2015. I'm very excited to be here. A couple of announcements before we get started. Security Weekly listeners receive 10% off products in our store with the discount code IHACKNAKED. That's right. If you hack naked and you want to tell everyone on your shirt, but if you're wearing the shirt, you're really not hacking naked, but that's okay because you're suggesting that others hack naked. Even though in our field, that's a very dangerous thing. You can buy Hack Naked shirts at shop.securityweekly.com. 10% off I Hack Naked is the discount code. Please join our new discussions mailing list. We've retired the old mailman server and moved to Google Groups. You can join the new list with a link in the show notes. I'd like to introduce my illustrious hosts that are here with me, but not really over the lines via Skype this evening. Uh, starting from left to right... Mr. Joff Thayer is here with us. Welcome, Joff. G'day, Paul. How are you? It's good to be here again, and good to see all the whole crew. Actually, a lot of the crew we saw <laughs> in show 400, but anyway. That's right. Uh, yeah, great great to be here. It's a wonderful new year. Is it is it, is it un, uncoordinated to say Happy New Year when it's still like the I think this is about now? the cutoff for that, Joff. So it's about the cutoff, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, after anyway. today, that's it. Uh, Carlos Perez is here with us from Puerto Rico. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Yes. And we've got a, a, a cast of characters over there on the rightmost frame in the video. I see Space Rogue with his typical antics. I see Jack Daniel's beard. They're at ShmooCon. And um, welcome Jack Daniel, Chris Thomas, a.k.a. Space Rogue. And is that – who is that? Oh, uh, Steve McGrath is there. I couldn't see him because of his hat. Welcome, Steve. I can't hear you guys, but welcome. I think Jack muted the microphone because <laughs> you guys were talking during the intro. That we just, we just yeah, that's that's so. Steve and uh, and Mr. Jeff Mann Jeff is here Mann somewhere, is but he is he is run away. He's not on camera. Okay. Uh, gotcha. For the for the news segment, we'll get a wide angle shot going. Yeah, I've got some very exciting news to talk about. Um, I love news. I'm excited about the news, Chris. I, I didn't know you were going to be here till just before the show. Neither did I. Yeah, so <laughs> I, we'll have to talk about the news because I'm, I'm excited about this week. I spent some time preparing it because I didn't know who was going to be on the show to discuss the news, so I spent a little extra time doing that. And now that you're here, I think it's going to be even more dynamic. All um, you need to do is find news from about 1995 and right. reread it. Exactly. Loft did it. Loft did it. And then Chris can say Loft did it to every news story. Excellent. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining and taking time out of your schmoo con to to do this. Uh, I want to introduce – uh, and we're going to have a technical segment. I should say our first interview is coming up. And then we're going to have a technical segment by Joff. And then we're going to get into the news. So hang in there. 
uh, listeners and viewers. Our interview for this evening is Kim Crawley, who was involved with computing at a very early age. At age eight, Crawley in managed to edit autoexec.bat on her father's Windows 3.0 machine, which for me, the computer never worked after I edited autoexec.bat, which says a lot about me. Um, but it sounds like you were more successful as your dad was complaining that the OS took too long to uh, boot. She's been on the web since 93. From there, she taught herself web development and is now an information security researcher with the InfoSec Institute specializing in malware and cyber warfare, which is a very timely topic. <laughs> Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so, uh, Kim, how did you get your start in information security, other than what I listed there? Uh, kind of fill in the, the blanks for us. Well, I started in IT by doing tech support back when I was in my early 20s. And I found that a large percentage of my tickets were related to security, like a lot of malware issues, usually. And it, I was mainly supporting Windows. So, and you know that Windows has always been like Swiss cheese with security vulnerabilities, right? And, you know, ever since the, the 90s, there's been loads of Windows malware on the internet. So, I saw, I saw like really minor, typical everyday malware issues. I saw some pretty catastrophic malware issues that affected workplaces, even like, even stuff like router malware and a lot more in depth stuff like that. And it started making me really interested in security. And I started writing for the InfoSec Institute's resources website back in 2011. And I've been contributing to their CEH and CISSP training program material. So it, it's been great. And I've had a lot of opportunities to write about various information security matters for CSO, CIO, computer world. I've got an article coming out in 2600 mag, I think, in the spring issue. So it's been great. Awesome. Now, you mentioned uh, router malware. Have you seen an increase in malware infecting embedded systems in the past three years or so? I don't know if there's been an increase. Like, there's been a lot. Hmm. I, 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 don't, I don't really have any solid way to measure whether there's more of it now than there was five years ago. I mean, obviously, Cisco equipment is more vulnerable just because... There's a lot more of it out where there, right? So if you're going to write something to target networking infrastructure, it would make more sense to write it for Cisco. But there's there's got to be some that affects Juniper and other technologies like that. So yeah, do you think it's our um, our limitations on detecting it, not so much an interest in writing it and implanting it on these systems that kind of makes it you know slip under the radar? Well, I mean, intrusion prevention systems are getting really sophisticated these days like it's really impressing me and you know we've made great strides in anomaly detection algorithms the past several years I, it's it's always a cat and mouse game like malware is a cat and mouse game drm and cracking drm is a cat and mouse game it's just all constant tom and jerry here and there you know a more a, a really secure technology will come out so we'll crack it it's all inevitable, right? You just got to stay on top. Um, so what, given that, what's the most effective way for organizations to deal with the malware problem? Like if you had to consult with an organization that was, was you know, we all deal with malware, um, and they were like, we feel like we're really losing the battle. Like what, what would be some of the top recommendations you'd have for them? Well, first of all, like, if I was looking at the details, like if I was going into the office and trying to get a sense for how each of the machines were configured and maybe looked at the servers in the back and all that. I mean, I would, from all my experience in tech support, you, you learn a lot that the really obvious dumb stuff is often overlooked. Like you could find that an AV shield hasn't gotten signatures for a few days. You could find that there's an OS install out there that hasn't been patched for over a year. 
So I, I look at the really obvious stuff first, and it's really depressing how often the obvious stuff gets overlooked. Oh. And then I see where it goes from there, right? Mm. The, what is it that uh, enables organizations uh, to run antivirus systems and have them be out of date? I feel like we talk about that problem a lot. Like, what leads to that, and what are the solutions to make sure that they're running more up-to-date uh, endpoint kind of protection software? Well, I've noticed CLAM. I've noticed CLAM and a few others like Kaspersky. They sometimes, for their consumer AV products, sometimes they get new signatures like more than once a day. So I, I, I see a antivirus signatures come out more frequently than they did like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if everything's configured properly, then you should be as secure as those signatures will allow you to be secure. Um, I haven't really done a comparison of different antivirus vendors. My husband has, mm -hmm. but I haven't. Um, so Kim, you, you wrote um, some articles on DRM and I, you know, I haven't been really close to the, the whole DRM thing for quite some time. Um, of course, when you know DVDs and such uh, came out, and there was a lot of news about DRM that we covered uh, years ago. But what you know, kind of update us on what's going on with the the DRM and um, that type of technology. Well, that series that I was writing for InfoSec Resources was focusing often on older DRM technologies, right? Like I got as old as the 10 NES chip that was on North American NES cartridges. Um, it seems now like big video game developers are relying more and more on online-based DRM with always-on requirements and stuff like that. And But we also have, we have rogue servers, right? I mean, for some really popular online games, there are even rogue servers to convince your pirated game on your client that it's legit because it gets the right data back. But I, I mean, the particular details of the DRM that's implemented with one application or another can vary quite a bit. Cool. Yeah. And like you said, that's definitely a cat and mouse game. Um, yeah. So Kim, you, um, you've, written a lot of articles on on cyber war and some people have uh a fundamental issue with that term um well how how do you define cyber war it's just when computer technology is used to deliberately harm someone i uh, usually when we talk about cyber warfare it's people from one nation trying to hurt people from another nation with computer technology and it seems that more and more warfare is going to be of that nature. Yeah, no, I think the more appropriate term is warfare, not necessarily war, right, being two different things. I look at them as more so targeted attacks from other countries um, that happen on an ongoing uh, basis. Um, of course, attribution is hard, and we see a lot of these attacks come out, such as Sony, for example. Oh, yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, what are some of the things in your mind that make uh, attribution very difficult? Well, I mean, there are all kinds of ways to spoof IP addresses. There are all kinds of ways to spoof MAC addresses. Or, you know, one party could be using proxy servers in a completely different country. So all of those are ways that it can be difficult to get the correct country and location for an attacker. If they're really sophisticated, they know what they're doing and they're covering their tracks. Are there, um, there's been a lot of uh, attacks that, you know, some people would think would be related to cyber warfare, but, but haven't, um, you know, do you have examples in your mind of attacks that we can with, somewhat degree of certainty uh, kind of uh, backs up our statements with respect to cyber warfare happening today. You mean incidences that were suspected to be cyber warfare that turned out not to be? Yeah, sure. Let's go there. Okay. 
Well, it appears Sony would be the prime example of that, right? There's a lot of dispute about whether it was North Korea or whether it was internal. And despite what the FBI is saying, it really seems now, based on what a couple of independent uh, security firms have said, that it is indeed internal. So, mm. so there's that. But I, I don't think... I don't think we erroneously attribute something to cyber warfare most of the time, right? It's just a matter of getting to the fine nitty gritty details. Well, I think a lot of it too is kind of like subbed out, right? And, you know, various countries find people in uh, positions that are able to do bad things to other countries um, and just kind of sub it out and proving that that happened is it, you know, of course, extremely difficult. So um, do you have uh, predictions as to like when the next, what the next incident may be or um, things that you've observed recently that would lead to kind I, of the next cyber warfare attack? I don't exactly know what the next major incident is going to be, but I think it's important for people to realize that China is going to become more and more of a problem when it comes to cyber warfare. That's something I've written about, too, in the past year. Mm -hmm. the, the, I think the most significant... Wait, go, go back. So why, why China? Why China? Well, because they're man manufacturing 90% of our stuff, because China has been known to engage in cyber warfare against the United States, against... Canada, against the UK, against other parts of Southeast Asia. So there have already been a lot of cyber warfare incidents that we've found were coming from the Chinese. And then there's another problem with all the back doors that they're putting into the routers and the cell phones and the PCs and the NICs and everything else that they're manufacturing for countries around the world. Mm. So, yeah, and I think it's going to be a huge problem. You wrote an interesting article on um, can security vulnerabilities kill? Can you kind of give people uh, an overview of that? Yeah, well, it's because of medical equipment that now comes with TCP IP stats. So the idea is that you can, for instance, monitor that physical implant with your web browser or whatever. But as soon as you open up something like that, there's definitely a way to black hat attack it. That's for damn sure. And a lot of these are medical appliances that were never on the internet until very recently. So it makes me wonder why they're doing it in the first place. Kim, do you have articles that you're, or an article you're working on now that you want to kind of give people a sneak preview for? Okay, I'm almost done an article about the latest version of Silk Road that's using the I2P network as opposed to Tor. Cool. So that's going to be really interesting. Nice. Um, so, uh, Kim, are you ready to play five questions? With sure thing. All righty. Three words to describe yourself. Three words. Blunt. Honest, intense. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, poison, probably. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Born on Friday the 13th. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. Okay, um... Drew Barrymore and Stephen Hawking. Very cool. Uh, and Kim, where can people find your blogs? Uh, I assume on the uh, InfoSec uh, okay. info Institute.com. Is that correct? Um, there are some really lengthy URLs. Yeah, they are. InfoSec Institute um, is one, correct? Resources.infosecinstitute.com. Eventually, you can navigate to InfoSec Resources. InfoSec Institute, the the Pepsi to your advertisers sans Coca-Cola. <laughs>
I'll drink whatever cold I'm paid to drink. Just don't expect me to drink any cold. <laughs> well, thank you very um, much. Oh, sorry. Just, Go ahead. Just, just Google me. Excellent. That's what I recommend. Excellent. Kim, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Paul. Thank you. With that, you have, we're going to take a, a show. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back, and Mr. Joff Thayer is going to give a technical segment about something. I, Joff, I haven't even looked at what it is, but I have trust that it's going to be awesome. Using regional internet registry data to build country attribution access control. Whew. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Joff's up next.